There are bestsellers and there are works of literary fiction. Now and then a book comes along that is both. But it's the exception that proves the rule, or is it? Well, this is a long-standing debate, and with the summer reading season just around the corner, let us revisit the feud. Joining us now for that, Deidre Lynch, the Ernest Birnbaum Professor of Literature at Harvard University and author of Loving Literature, A Cultural History. Nick Mount, Associate Professor of English at the University of Toronto and Fiction Editor at The Walrus Magazine. Russell Smith, columnist at The Globe and Mail and author of Confidence. And, of course, we welcome back Jennifer Robson, author most recently of Moonlight Over Paris. Good to have you all around our table here at TVO. Uh, Russell, what differentiates a bestseller and a literary oh, novel? Great. Start with me. Uh. <laughs> uh, look, nothing does. Uh, literary novels can be hugely commercially successful, as we've seen. If we even look at the current bestseller list, we see that it's a mix, particularly in Canada, of the literary and the so-called genre. Now, there's it's a huge debate over what classifies genre. Usually there are several genres, uh, such as science fiction, romance, western, uh, YA, which tends to be a subgenre of romance. Um, Sorry, western YA? So, YA, no, young adult fiction tends young to be adult. a okay. subgenre of romance mm -hmm. uh, aimed at young people. Um, and, and thrillers, crime novels, etc. In content, they tend to follow certain tropes. That is, they tend to follow certain conventions and formulas of of storytelling, which literary fiction uh, does not have to follow, uh, and, this, and the setting is not so, not so narrowly defined as well. But the big difference that um, people don't like or tend to talk about as much is a difference in the interest in style or technique. That is, literary fiction tends to focus more on language as language, uh, that, the, that the people who say they follow it are interested in sentences as sentences, as innovative, as poetic, as impressionistic, as minimalist. Genre fiction, people tend to read for story, for content, rather than for form. I'm watching Deidre, and she's sort of uh, mm. wondering how much of this she's signing on to. I'm signing on to a lot of it, but I would say that sometimes I'm, I'm the sort of person who can read say, Charlotte Bronte, uh, for the plot over and over and over again. Oh, will Mr. Rochester and Jane get together in, in the end? And when I'm reading it that way, I think I'm, I'm not reading it as the literary fiction that it becomes when I bring it into the English department classrooms. So, so otherwise, I think I would agree very much with Russell's uh, differentiation of, of or lack re uh, refusal to differentiate uh, uh, all that firmly literary fiction from popular fiction. In which case, let me ask the other professor here: What does it take to get it into the classroom? Hmm. Um, has to be short. <laughs> and, and available from a publisher at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, you know, weight, depth, the stuff that's done well in the academy has tended to be stuff that needed explanation, mm -hmm. which is one of the major factors that plays against accessible genre plot-driven literature, because by and large, you just read it and enjoy it. Whereas something like, you know, The Wasteland of Ulysses, it takes a professor to stand up there and explain it to you, which is why we pick those books, because it makes mm -hmm. us both that much smarter. In which case, let me, you want to, Sanders, should we bring this list up right now? Here's a Global Mail's Canadian fiction bestseller list. This is from June 11th. And we start with Kathy Reichs speaking in Bones and The Illegal from Lawrence Hill. And down the list we go. And there's our top ten. And do, I mean, Jennifer, you look at that list. Does that list, I don't know, does it speak to you in any particular way? It does. Way? It does. Yeah. Those are all books that, that if I haven't read already, I, I, I want to read. They're right. interesting books. They're, they're, they're profoundly different. Um, and I don't see why they can't all coexist on, on a list at once. Um, you know, sometimes when we break down the lists, as Russell was saying, into the, the subgenres and so on, what it does is give an opportunity for people like myself who write genre fiction to, to leap a little higher <laughs> up the respective list. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't really, there, there are moments when I, I think to myself, is it, is it worth uh, for myself asking where my books belong or, is it, or, or should the work that I do uh, concentrate on writing the best possible book? Uh, for my readers, uh, who have come to expect a certain type of book from me, and um, and I'm not, I, I'll fully admit, I'm not experimenting with the boundaries of the genre. I'm not looking to reinvent the novel. Uh, what I look to do in my books is write a story that the people will enjoy. Do you feel, following up on what Nick just had to say, that when people read your books, uh, they need a professor at the front of the room oh God, I helping hope not. <laughs> hope, further analyzing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I mean, insofar with my books, 
as an historian, uh, I, I like to think that people will come away from reading the books knowing a little bit more about the period of the Great War, a little bit more about the people who lived through it. And if I'm teaching, it's a gentle kind of teaching. I, it's not that that feeling of having being force-fed something in grade 10. Pedagogy. Uh, yeah, and, and finally enough, I remember, for example, in grade 10 English, uh, being force-fed fifth business uh, and and hating it. Force-fed? Force-fed. Such and, but an then, awesome book. It is now, be, because then I, when I went back in my 20s and reread it, I, I was blown away by how much I liked it. And I couldn't, I, for the life of me, why did I hate it so much then and, and love oh, it now? Robertson Davies, close your ears. Don't let her hear that. <laughs> okay, you saw that Globe and Mail list. D do the books feel all of a sort on that list together for you? Oh, there are wildly different kinds of books on that list. I mean, I'm, I'm with Russell to a point. I think that the point where I leave you is that uh, literary books are as subject to convention as genre fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as somebody reads the slush pile for the walrus, and you see a lot of what, mm -hmm. what is sometimes called derogatively MFA fiction. Mm -hmm. and, and you can tell. I mean, yeah. it's stuff that focuses more on description than on plot. Um, but there's also a particular Canadian genre, isn't there? Yeah. Best-selling literary Canadian fiction has particular conventions. Yeah. Uh, it does tend to be historical, actually. It mm. tends to be about the past and memory and family and loss. So those are conventions as strict as any Western. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, true. the most important difference is ultimately between a good book and a bad book. Mm -hmm. But there's still differences between the two, between <laughs> literary, the literature that aspires to, 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 to literary recognition and literature that aspires to sell. Sure. Deidre, when did we start to regard novels as either literary hmm. or commercial? A lot. It, it was a fairly late development. I mean, not the problem was that novels were commercial from the get-go. Unlike other genres, unlike drama, unlike poetry, they have no existence in manuscript culture. People argue about, about this. So, But novels grew up in as print culture grew up, and they grew up as part of a commercialization of culture. So it took a really long time for novels to become literary, about a century. Um, and they became literary when people started writing mm. historical fiction. As it happens, even if now I think the tendency would be to demote historical fiction from the category of literary fiction. But Walter Scott, at the start of the 19th century, he is the person who made the the novel respectable um, mm -hmm. by turning to the past, by teaching people mm -hmm. things very gently yeah. through his fiction. And how about that genre, historical fiction? You a, a, a fan or not? I am a fan. Mm -hmm. I am actually a huge fan of historical fiction. Uh, and I don't understand exactly the, the, the wish among many people to demote it or to feminize it, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. to say, which is almost to say the same thing in two different mm -hmm. ways. Uh, yeah. Jennifer, how's your work received by the broader world? Let's put it that way. The broader world, I, I, I reasonably well, I would like to think. I try hard not to pay too much attention to that. Um, but I, what's interesting is I, I, more and more I, I get uh, emails and letters from men who've said mm -hmm. to me, uh, I saw your book on the coffee table at home. My wife had read it, and I just opened it up, and I wasn't sure what to think of it. And then I read it, and I, I it surprised myself by really liking it. Hello. Uh, <laughs> and I that's think that's as here. much a, a function of, of how they're marketed. The, the covers are, are, are decidedly, you know, designed with with the female <laughs> reader in mind. Really? Um, that's think? not to say. <laughs> Let's take a look at that. I mean, they're, they're very pretty covers. Yes. Um, you know, I wonder if they were given different covers to whom they would appeal necessarily. I mean, it's a question you, you can ask about any genre. Pop a different cover on it from what is the expected cover, and, mm -hmm. and would you find a different readership? It's, it's a question I don't have the answer to. Russell? I think it's interesting to point out, too, that writers don't always choose their genre. Mm -hmm. The publishers do for them, and Good it's point. a marketing mm -hmm. decision rather yeah. than an artistic mm -hmm. decision. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that the publisher will tell you, we're going to try to sell this as genre X, and that might come as a surprise uh, yeah. to certain writers. You don't often set out. Do you read producers. popular fiction? Not much, no. I'm firmly in the, in the snobbish literary camp. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, 
Um, is that a prerequisite to be a globe colonist? <laughs> no, no, no. And I'm and I'm certainly um, against social. I'm, I'm bucking against the the, the um, intellectual trends at the moment. I mean, that's certainly the most popular intellectual trend uh, among among hipster thinkers. If I could if I could phrase it in so crude a way, <laughs> is is to say that we should not make any of these distinctions anymore. And that and this is a very postmodernist attitude that the high and the low should be all jumbled together in our culture as they are in our everyday lives. We must read them all with the same standards. I still come back to this issue of, of style, though, because I do see frequently, uh, there are many, many exceptions. This is a sweeping generalization. But fr frequently, um, I've been reading a lot of YA, young adult fiction, recently, because I've been, I've been uh, studying a lot of, about self-publishing. People who make a lot of money self-publishing these days tend to write genre fiction rather than literary fiction. Um, I often come from business backgrounds rather than artistic backgrounds. And, and a lot of young adult fiction is selling wildly without the help of publishers and institutions. If you look at that, which sells very, wild, very, very well, you'll find that there is a consistency of style. There is a YIA style, very different from the MFA style that Nick is describing, where that is minimalist, the YIA style is maximalist. It is chatty. It's explanatory. There is a protagonist who thinks a lot, and we are privy to her thoughts. And it's explained in a kind of breathless conversational prose. Um, it's the opposite of the MFA dictum, which is to show, not tell. It's telling rather than showing. It's maximalist. It's, it's explicit rather than implicit. Let's get another view here. Uh, if you would, Sheldon, let's bring up this graphic. Author Jennifer Weiner believes that this isn't simply a matter of snobbery, whereby, quote unquote, art is valued over commerce and populism, but that a gender bias is at play, too, against fiction written by and for women. Nick Hornby and David Nichols, she argues, also write humorous, highly commercial fiction, often about relationships, but are widely reviewed and highly regarded. I do think there is an inherent double standard, she says. What men produce is deemed art. What women produce is deemed craft. What do you think? Historically, that's certainly true. Not yes. the case anymore? Uh, uh, no, I think it, it continues to be the case. This is, mm. this is a long-standing trend. I mean, there, there's the famous example in mid-19th century America of Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne, complaining about hordes of scribbling women, um, as if kind of the, it's almost a sort of mechanical, physical motion, rather than having any sort of thought involved in it. So, mm. so I, I, I think that, that Jennifer Weiner is on to to something. I would say what I worry about is, as, as a sort of teacher of English is that fiction itself is becoming feminized, mm -hmm. that very few men are, and very few young men um, of undergraduate age uh, willingly embark on, on the reading of fiction, period. Nick, do we have to plead guilty? Do men have to plead guilty to the views just expressed by Jennifer Weiner? Well, by and large, I mean, Deidre's right. The main audience for fiction, certainly in this country, ha has been, you know, since we started having novels that sold, has been women and continues to be women. I don't know if the problem she's pointing to is quite as acute here, precisely because of that reason, because most of our biggest writers are also women. So, you know, you look, there are, for young women writers coming up in Canada today, there are very significant female predecessors as models who were accepted as artists and artistic writers from the get-go. So I don't think the problem that she's talking about is quite as acute here. It does crop up, but... Jennifer, you ever run into this double standard? So, is it a double standard? I, my experience uh, of literary uh, snobbery, it, it, it typically, the conversation typically starts with somebody approaching me and saying, I haven't read any of your books, but, but. and then they launch into a critique of the books or the genre as a whole. Mm. And when I was, when my first book was published uh, and, and I was still feeling overwhelmed by the fact that it had simply been published, I, I would be content to stand and talk with them and hear what they had to say, even though it frankly was uh, worthless uh, in mm. the sense that if you haven't read the books you're talking about, Why am I listening wh where to you? is the, where's your leg <laughs> yeah. to stand on? Yeah. And now I will typically say, just cut them off politely and say, I can't have this conversation with you unless you've read my books. Do you, do you, do you add, and hundreds of thousands of people have, incidentally. Well, no, uh, well, you know, they, they can that. discover that by themselves, <laughs> or by themselves I suppose, yeah. but, but really, and it, it, happened, it happens all the time where somebody has a, an opinion about a particular genre and they haven't necessarily read widely in that genre. Mm -hmm. And it would be uh, the, similar to, to my pontificating about science fiction, what's happening with science fiction. It, 
even though that's a genre I, I, I enjoy when I read it, but I certainly don't know enough about it to have, mm. have a, a learned opinion on it. Okay, Nick, let's try this. Are there best-selling books out there that those who see themselves mostly or only as literary readers ought to read? Hmm. Best-selling books that those who see the well, I'm at, again in Canada, I think those books are already mm -hmm. finding their audience. So Andre Alexis's Fifteen Dogs, which is both mm -hmm. a critical success and a bestseller, um, it's true in the States as well. I mean, we forget this, but one of the uh, one of the, the sort of pre-requirements for a novel, a modern American novel, to become accepted in the classroom was that it first had to be a bestseller, mm -hmm. and part of that simply has to do with with professors noticing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49 was a bestseller and an extremely difficult book. What is it about? Uh, <laughs> you got an hour? No. <laughs> Good point. I should have asked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, that's a weak answer. That is, no, yeah, no, yeah, that yeah. was a bad question because yeah. that's right. I, to, what about to, genre, Nick? I mean, what, what would you say there's a genre, a book that fits clearly a genre that the literary person would be a snob not to read? Hmm. There's been a number of those accepted, like um, sort of the noir novels in particular yeah. have been sort yeah. of elevated to the literary, yeah. like yeah. Dashiell Hammett, Dashiell Hammett mm -hmm. right? Chandler, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the most important distinction is ultimately between a good book and a bad yeah. book, right? Yeah. Wherever it comes from, but there's still a difference. And one of the ways you know there's a difference is that when literary writers write genre fiction, they like to let you know that they know that they're writing genre <laughs> fiction. Well, let's, as we approach summer, consider not whether a book is good or bad, but whether it is heavy or light. Because the assumption is, as we go into the summer, it is a time only for light reading. Because goodness knows we can't tax our brains with anything too heavy at the cottage or on the beach or wherever we're going. Is that an appropriate way to approach the summer in your view, Deidre? I think summer does open up these, or at least we have the illusion that it will open up spaces in which we will get to read uninterrupted. And I have to say, I just choose very long books for the summer, uh, the ones that I know I won't be able to get finished during during the school year. Um, because you have fewer outside uh, interruptions. Exactly. Kind of I, I, I have see. no students in office hours in the summer. Gotcha. Yes. So what's yes. on your list? Um, well. What is on my list? Um, I am going to reread, actually, Elena Ferrante this summer, the Neapolitan Quartet. I've already read it once, but I'm going to reread it. Be Why? Uh, because you can read it once for the plot and then once for the astonishing uh, style for what she's doing with the novel tradition, with the tradition of having uh, a single heroine. This is a book that has two heroines, um, and or at least we think it does. Uh, Don't you think to yourself, though, if I, read a, if I read a book that I've already read again, what am I not getting a chance to read for the first time because I'm doing that? I think that, but I also believe strongly in, in kind of rereading, disclosing things to you that you don't see the first time. And, and especially the first time you read the Ferrante novels, you read for the plot, you think, what is the hmm. awful thing that is just around the corner yeah. for, hmm. for these protagonists? I want to see what it's like okay. to not be distracted by Russell, that light or heavy this summer? I don't even really get what that discussion might look like in practice. I mean, because, because the books that are called light to me, often uh, seem a little bit dull, and then I find that they're heavy for me to get through. So I need mm. some, I mean, I need to be excited to have fun. I need intellectual stimulation, mm. and that might count as heavy to some people. Got a title know. you want to pass along? I am just beginning uh, Don DeLillo's new novel, Zero K, which is um, uh, a bit aphoristic and uh, heavy in style, but it has science fiction elements as it's set slightly in the future. Nick, what's on your list this summer? I just started, as my research for your show, I started trying to read the, what's it called, The Girl in the Spider's Nest, the most recent one from, from the, the girl who kicked the hornet's nest, and it, I fell asleep. Yeah. How about you? So I have a, a stack of, in my, my, in my to be read, you know, the TBR pile that people talk about, mm. I have a stack that's, that's built up over the last few months while I've been finishing my latest book. Uh, one book that's on it is Hazel Gaynor's new historic, work of historical fiction called The Girl from the Savoy, which is set in a period that I love in the 1920s and 1930s. Mm. And she, she exemplifies somebody who's writing, she's at the top of her game, so to speak, in terms of writing historical fiction. And uh, the books are beautifully researched. They're, you're propelled through them. I find a very kind of compulsive reading. I tend to 
her previous books I've, I've picked up at 10 at night and then found myself finishing them in the wee hours. Um, and then I just, I have a pile of, of, of uh, nonfiction, which is the research for my next book, which I'm diving into, you know, in, it feels like five minutes from now I'll What's be that opening. About? I'm, I can't really say just yet, uh, but it'll be set in, in the, the, the next book that I've just finished is set in the Second World War. And then the, the book after that, which I'm about to begin writing, is set uh, in the early post-war period, so mid-1940s. Cool. I, I am nothing like any of you. I'm reading a biography of George Bush, the father, by John Meacham over the summer. <laughs> That's light reading for me. I'm going to enjoy that. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming around this table to TVO tonight and talking about uh, literary fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.